Good morning, everybody. Courage to Change, April 5th. As wonderful as, <clears throat> as wonderful as it is to see a loved one find sobriety, it often presents a whole new set of challenges. After all the years of waiting, many of us are dismayed when sobriety does not bring the happily ever after ending we awaited. We once knew exactly what to expect, and now everything suddenly seems different. The homebody is never home. The life of the party is always sleeping. Communication, intimacy, sex, responsibilities, and decision-making all change. At the same time, problems that we always attributed to drinking may persist, even though the drinking has stopped. This stirs up some very strong feelings within many of us. Even longtime Al-Anon members may find it more important than ever to go back to the basics of our program and learn once more to focus on ourselves. It's all right to feel disappointed, skeptical, resentful, joyous, excited, or confused about our changing circumstances. By accepting whatever we feel and sharing about it with the other Al-Anon members, we are better to able to take care of ourselves. I will allow myself the dignity to discover exactly how I feel about the changes that are happening today, and I will share those feelings with an Al-Anon friend. Well, this is a very important reading. There's a few reasons it's very important. One, if you were at the boot camp this last weekend that I held surviving someone else's alcoholism, you remembered me talking about this. Okay? So, <laughs> um... You know, what's, what, what does it say? We, we are so happy, right, when someone gets sober. But when they get sober, so, sobriety might not bring the happily ever after ending that you've awaited for. Right? Everything suddenly, suddenly seems different. The homebody's never home. The life of the party's always sleeping. Communication, intimacy, sex, responsibilities, and decision-making all change. Um... Problems that we attributed to drinking may persist. What's that mean? Well, if you were at the boot camp, you remember me talking about alcoholism being a mental illness and that the drinking was actually the solution. So the person quits drinking, but the problems persist because it's untreated alcoholism, right? So <laughs> there's a saying in AA. I never understood it for a long time. It says, if you... If, you sober up a horse thief, all you have is a sober horse thief. What that means is drinking is only a part of the problem, right? That's actually helping them deal. You take away the drinking and you still have the problem, okay? And they need to deal with that. They need to treat that with a, some kind of spiritual answer, uh, whatever that is, however they find that. Um, there's lots of ways to do that. But unless you're treating that thinking, that thinking persists. Negativity, blaming, selfish, self-centeredness. Now it's worse because they're not drinking, right? Now they're irritable, restless, discontent. So you have to really wrap your mind around the fact that the drinking is only a symptom of the problem. There's a problem here. And once someone sobers up and they get better, they might not behave the way you think they should still. They might be at meetings all the time. They might be sleeping. You know, the reason they sleep is when you get sober, you are exhausted mentally, emotionally, physically. You are absolutely exhausted. And I slept for about a year and a half. Every chance I got, I laid down and slept. My body was healing, my mind, my spirit, my soul right? Every inch of me, I didn't have time to really jump back into the family. See, if you think drinking's the only problem, then you're going to expect them to quit drinking and just, right, go back. Uh, there's no going back. So there's new. There's new if they're not drinking anymore, and there's new if they don't stop. So give up that fairy tale idea that you can go back to a Norman Rockwell you know, kind of situation. You love an alcoholic. 
it's going to be different whether they get sober or not. So what's that, what's that mean to someone like me? That means they're not really even the problem. It's me. My reaction is the problem. I have to take care of myself so that I can deal whatever happens. If they became an AA guru and I never see them again, or if they don't get sober at all and end up living in their mother's basement, right? Or grandma, <laughs> grandma's basement or grandpa's basement. You know what I mean? So this idea that we have in our head that there's this, you know, and I blame it on Barbie. You know, I blame it up bringing, being brought up in the 70s and 80s when we had these dolls. You know, they should have had dolls with real problems, <laughs> right? So we could say, oh, I see. Life is going to have its difficulties and I have to be able to handle it. Not that there's this perfect Malibu Barbie and Ken and that little baby that never cries or, or, or needs to be changed, you know, in the fantastic little Maserati they drive in or whatever, convertible, uh, flying on jets, right? <laughs> Oh my God, this, these images are like damaging because life is life, right? And their people are gonna have problems and I need to be able to take care of myself so I can enjoy my life and let, let people be people. Whatever they're gonna do, sober or drunk, right? I have to let go of expectations. Expectations are premeditated resentments. I'm telling you right now. If you're expecting someone to get clean and sober and your life is going to be better, you're mistaken. You're going to feel, when someone gets sober, at first you're elated and you're excited and you're, woo! And then comes the letdown. Wait a minute. I'm not getting what I want. Well, the reason you're not getting what you want is because you're not giving it to yourself. You have to be a whole person. Right? You're not waiting for someone to get well so they can fix you, so you feel better. I mean, really, if you take a step back, doesn't that seem insane? To think my happiness depends on that? It doesn't. My happiness depends on what I'm doing today. Can I love someone who's sick? Yes, I can. I do. Can I allow them to be sick? I can now. It was unacceptable to me before. I had to fix it. I couldn't stand the idea that wasn't matching up to what I imagined. And a lot of that's my own ego. I'll be honest with you. Um, I had to let go of those ideas. And I had to say, okay, if they're going to get sober, I don't know what the journey's going to look like. Right? It might work out perfect. It's going to work out perfect regardless of what you think, right? It's going to be perfect whether they get sober or not because it's all in the big scheme of things, right? There's a plan bigger than you. You just don't see. You're seeing a little teeny part of the picture, not the whole picture. None of us get to see the whole picture. Hindsight's always 2020. So you got to stay in the moment, look after yourself, and allow people to be themselves allow them their own consequences, uh, allow them their own recovery, right? And recovery takes work. It balances out later. But at first, a person has to dive all in, all in. If they're in a 12-step program, they're going to jump. If they're serious and they get involved, they're going to jump all in. And that does not mean you have to get in, not into their program, maybe into yours. Okay, so that will even out and you'll find your happy balance and you'll say, oh my gosh, you know, this is recovery, right? There's recovery in our home now. So the reason I do these boot camps is not so you can get someone sober. It's so you can be happy regardless of if they're sober. Regardless of what other people are doing, you need to be able to be happy. And live your own life without guilt and shame and remorse. 
right? You need to walk free of all that alcoholism, right? So let go of the, I, you know, the Barbie doll, you know, ideal, the leave it to beaver, you know, that it just is, it, it's a show, right? It's a show. So you've got to really jump into your own recovery and allow the person to do what they're going to do, even if they're sober. If they want to go to meetings. See, that's why people get so resentful. They don't have a program of their own. They're so used to being in that hula hoop with the other person. All of a sudden, the person wants to really make their hula hoop AA. They finally got sober. They finally got an answer. And you're in there going, there's no room in here for me. And you get resentful. And I've known families that have actually, you know, uh, preferred the person drunk. Because it meant their needs better, right? They knew what to expect. They knew how to handle it. They were in control. So you have to create your own hula hoop. So when they get sober, you're okay, right? You have to do that. I mean, this is not really an option. If you want to live a happy, joyous, and free life, you have got to do the things that are suggested. Go to Al-Anon and listen to these people. Right, go to CODA or ACOA and listen to people that are walking through this. I've walked through it. You're listening to me, but you'll see, wow, that's the same as what Karen said. You know, these are not new ideas. Right? I learned it the hard way. And I'm trying to make it a little easier for you. It seems like in your life, sobriety has been the ultimate goal. If this person would just stop doing that, if my son would stop heroin, everything would be okay. I'm here to tell you that's not true. I guess I'll end it with that. I want you to really think about that, okay? And you're going to say, no, Karen, you don't get it. No, I get it. I have, I have jumped out of someone's hula hoop. And, you know, I, I, I'm still helpful, I still love, and I'm, you know, I get all that, but I've had to work on my own hula hoop, or I wouldn't have made it. They might have made it, right? They'd be fine. They'd probably still be in their little unhealthy mental health issue hula hoop, but I would not have made it. I can't, I couldn't take it. I couldn't, I couldn't uh, mentally, emotionally. I just could not. And then it was affecting me physically. I mean, I just couldn't do it. Um, so I had to, I had to get a hula hoop. I had to start working on my hula hoop and I had to get every, out of everybody else's and drop my expectations. Okay. Recovery is absolutely mandatory. I mean, you might not think so right now, but, uh, you know, it's, it's really not just for you, but for your other children or your other family members or the, your business, you know, whatever it is in your life, uh, you know, if you're a, a father and, and um, you know, there's a lot of men that are struggling with this issue and they're raising their kids, you know, while mom is kind of out there, um, it's mandatory to me that you have your own hula hoop and your own answer, your own tools so you can be there for your children. Right, And you don't keep repeating this pattern of finding the sickest hula hoops. You know, you find yourself in this spot. I know I'm going on a little too long. You find yourself in a spot where you look around and everybody around you has very sick hula hoops. Like, why does that happen? Well, as you work on your hula hoops you kind of uh, raise your vibration if you listen to any, uh, you know, any kind of a, um, I don't want to say metaphysical, you know, your vibration, it's more science. You change and things around you start changing. And all of a sudden you find healthier hula hoops, right? You're hanging in healthier hula hoops. That's one of the reasons I want you to go to Al-Anon this week. 
it's Tuesday. I gave you a seven day challenge if you were in that boot camp to go to three Al Anon or AO, ACOA or CODA, whatever feels right for you, Naranon. Go to three meetings this week because those people have healthy hula hoops. They have strong hula hoops. They've been in the sick hula hoop. They had to get out of it. Sometimes they went from sick hula hoop to sick hula hoop to sick hula hoop, right? Their loved ones got sober and they still were sick. You need to see that because you can't see it in yourself, but you can see it in someone else. So take the suggestions I gave you this week. Are you zipping it? I'm assuming that everyone on here went to the boot camp. I'm probably wrong, but zip it. Read my posts on my, my regular page. I did one on about how things, you know, if you can just pause before you respond, take a breath. Not everything needs to be responded to right now. <sighs> Breathe. I did some grounding techniques um, with the oak tree last weekend at that boot camp. And, you know, get yourself grounded. Take a breath. Use some different neutral phrases. You know, don't volunteer for anything. Make a make an appointment for a, a haircut or a manicure or get your color done or take a nap, right? Go for a jog. Go to a yoga class you haven't been to. Do something and start creating the hula hoop of your dreams. So when you meet someone else with a good solid hula hoop, you can stay in yours. They can stay in theirs and you can have a wonderful relationship. But this idea of just giving up your life to take someone else over, that's why this reading says, once they get sober, you might not be so happy. That's because you're stranded. And so many people at that boot camp commented to me and said, oh my God, when you said, look around and look for your hula hoop, do you know where it even is? It hit them hard. It's because as, I think, especially as caretakers, I won't say women, because there's a lot of men now that are holding down the whole fort uh, because the women are so sick, right? So if you're holding down the fort, uh, you gotta have some gas for your engine to keep this, this thing going, right? You wanna be happy for the other children, for your parents, you know, for everyone else in your world. And you want to be okay in your hula hoop when they do find recovery. If and when. Anyway, quite a bit today. Sorry about that. Love you all. See you tomorrow.